We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the all peaceful, the most peaceful, the most merciful. And we send peace and blessings to his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah be pleased with him. And we ask him inshallah ta'ala that he untie any knots from my tongue so that, that I may be understood. Is this on? And last week we started a book called A Hundred Hadiths about Islamic manners or in Islamic manners. And we might get through the, all the hadiths before Ramadan and we may not get through them. The goal is not to finish a book. As big as the book may seem, the goal is not to finish the book. The goal is to benefit from the book, inshallah ta'ala. And if you leave here understanding two, three, four hadiths, you will leave here with a lot, inshallah ta'ala. Not because I'm going to give you knowledge you've never heard before, but I'm merely going to remind all of us of many things we have heard over and over from scholars who are more qualified. And like some of the scholars said, that are very well known of the ulama, they said about them, there's many scholars that are very well known and have way more knowledge than most of the ones we know. But the ones who are known, they might have a little bit more audacity than those who are not. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this audacity is in khayr. And it's not for show. And it's not for the sake of the people. That it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having that said, the hadith that we've talked about last week, the, the preordainment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we got to the point where we were talking about that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was talking to Ibn, Ab on, on, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he was talking to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, as he was riding behind him or walking behind him like we explained, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, let me teach you a few words. That if you protect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you protect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. And it's very important we mention that we keep the commandments. That we keep the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we got to the point where we talked about if the entire of humanity gathers to benefit one of us with anything that Allah has not decreed for us. Because there's a difference between decreed for you and decreed upon you. Who can help us out with the difference? Because we're going to start asking the little questions here and there, inshallah ta'ala, to make sure that we are understanding. 
and so we don't fall asleep. Because I'm wide awake, alhamdulillah. Who can help us out? What's the difference between decreed for you and decreed upon you? Like we say in Arabic, kutiba lak wa kutiba alayk. What is the difference? So when you read this, you understand what this means. No one? Well, I have to answer then, inshallah ta'ala. Kutiba laka kullu ma laka fa huwa khayr. Everything that is for you is good. Everything that's been set upon you, it's something that you will have hardship in. كُلَّمَا كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ أو قَدَّرَهُ عَلَيْكَ فَهُوَ اِمْتِحَانٌ لَكْ أو عُقُوبَةٌ لَكْ Meaning that everything that Allah has decreed upon you or has written upon you is going to be of harm to you. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to harm you. لا. قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ Say that this harm that is inflicted upon you is from yourselves, from your evil deeds. It's by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees upon a believer, something in its appearance is harmful. Something in its appearance that is not good for us, that we don't like, like the death of a child, losing your house, Losing your money, losing your job, losing your wife, losing your husband. When we look at these things, we say, these are things that harm us, that hurt us. We feel pain. They have been decreed up on us. But when you receive wealth, when you receive, when you get married, when you get something, that is, this is for you. This is a decreed for you. هذا لك والثاني عليك. And when we say upon you, it's something that falls upon you. If you look at the meaning, even in Arabic, عليك كل 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 ما يأتي عليك يأتي من فوق. Something has fallen on you. Fallen means something you were not ready for, something you were not prepared for, and something you don't want to have. And the other one is for you. It's like when you say, here, this is for you. And the other one is, this is upon you. But even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decrees something upon us for the believers, like we talked about, it's not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do harm to us. No. It's not that at all. Even in its appearance, it is harmful for us. This is better for us for the Akhirah, for the believers. This is better for us for the Akhirah without a doubt. Because if you are patient, when a child dies for you, do you know the reward that is waiting for you on the Day of Judgment? For a parent, it's the toughest thing is to lose a child. Especially if that child grows up in age and they get attached to them or especially if they are highly educated and we spent a lot of money on their education and right before they graduate or become a doctor or whatever it is and they pass on. This is a big fitna for the parents. Maybe it was better for that person to die early because if they remained on that path, maybe they would have got to kuf. And maybe if you remain on that path, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not decree upon you a death that was going to wake you up, that you would have died on kuf. Or you would have went to hellfire for a couple of million years or whatever it is to be purified. So everything that the Muslim, especially the believer, the mu'min, has to go through in this dunya, and it's hardship, it's better for the Muslim and the mu'min. Either it's purifying him or it's elevating his status in Jannah. There's no doubt about that. So when you believe in this, 
If something happens to you, you don't get upset and you don't get mad. This doesn't mean when something happens to you, you have to be happy and you say, hey, come on, this happened to me, I'm gonna invite you for dinner. It's like when you graduate, you throw a party, or you memorize Quran, you throw a party, a halal party, not party, what we're thinking party. It's like when you, somebody, receives a very test and hardship, they get extremely happy and they say, come on, man, I'm going to buy you dinner. Why? What's the occasion? Oh, man, I inflicted a really deep hardship. Are there Muslims like this? Are there believers? There are very, very few. That you have to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to accept the hardship that's been decreed upon you, but it doesn't mean that you have to be happy. You can still have pain, but with acceptance. But to actually be content, this is of the highest, of the highest status of Iman. أن تكون راضيا بالقضاء ومع ذلك تكون فرحان بالقضاء. That you're actually happy because you know your vision, your thought process, your life. قل إن محياي ومماتي قل إن نسكي ومحياي ومماتي لله رب العالمين. Say that my slaughter, my life, my death, my worship. Is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning his vision is always on the ball that will take him to Jannah, the direction. So when harm is inflicted upon him or her, he says, Alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is either purifying me from my sins or Allah is going to elevate me in Jannah. And he actually goes from dealing with the hardship in a hard way to move in, in a contentment, in a happiness of this happened to him. And this is the utmost of contentment. And not to get into uh, all of this because th this would, we would need many, many lectures to talk about this, but to at least put it in its frame, inshallah ta'ala. So if the Muslim is a hundred percent sure in their heart that nothing that happens to them in life is by accident they will live this life in a easier and happier state and I tell you a little story that one of the Mashayikh was talking about there was a a man and this I believe happened in Egypt all my stories are from Egypt I guess And he had the first child and the first child would die. And for those of you who know the Arabs, the Arabs are very attached to boys in general. You'll find like the grandmother, as soon as a girl comes, it's like, oh, girl, where's the boy? It, it's, it's a nature. And I don't know if it's like this in your culture or not. It's very few men that say, yeah, the girl, and they're happy and they're excited, especially for the first. It's a cultural thing. It's nothing against the sisters or the women. It's the women that do this. So it's the sisters that will be doing this. <laughs> Don't look at me the, in a weird way. <clears throat> so this child will live for a few months and then it will die. And this happened to him three or four times. And on the fifth or sixth time, this man, this man, had a fifth child or his last child happened to grow until the age of 17. And like we said, when the child grows older, <clears throat> you are more attached to them. Like anyone that you associate with as friendship, as wife, as husband. The more you live with someone, the more you get to know them, the more you are attached to them. Emotionally. And this child died. So what do you think this Muslim did? He went on top of the building that he lives in 
so he can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'udhu billah min ghadab billah. And he got on the edge of the building, the highest point of that building, and he looked up to the sky and he said, what did I do to you? What do you want from me? Well, guess what happened when he did that and he got so mad? He slipped and he fell off the building. Do you think this person died in a state of Islam and Iman? And he's going to go be with the Sahaba in Jannah? He was not happy with the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But more importantly that he was not happy with this Qadr for the first, second, third, fourth child. There was something boiling inside him. And only, the only one who knows this is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sooner than later show to others that which you are hiding. So be careful what you are hiding. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this deen. In most cases the hypocrites will be revealed. Not maybe to all of us but to some of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal them. The Sahaba, they knew who the hypocrites were. But they couldn't say with certitude because the wahi was done after the Prophet But they knew not to associate with them. They were cautious. Because the mu'min, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him yusamma bi al basira that he can see things. Maybe in our culture we call it a sixth sense. That if the mu'min is in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows him things that he doesn't show to other people. He can see things that other people can't see. So this person wasn't happy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah wanted him to be example to somebody else. Allah wanted him to be an example for us to tell this story here tonight. So we have to be very, extremely cautious when it comes to being happy or accepting of the Qadr. Because when Ibrahim, when the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibrahim died, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam aina that he, his eyes, he wept Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that we have pain by leaving you, Ya Ibrahim. Ibrahim but this doesn't mean you are not accepting. That you don't say, Alhamdulillah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allahumma khlufli fi musibati, Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran minha. Oh Allah, give me ajr of this hardship and replace it with something better. If you say this, I had a brother, subhanAllah, he says, every time I say this, wallahi, something better comes out of it. And he always reminds me, he says, Ya Muhammad, do this. In most, in most cases I do, but he is very religious. Any little thing, even if the coffee spills, he says, Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa khlufli khayran min. And when you teach yourself this, you will start to program yourself to be accepting and maybe even get to the point to be happy with the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See this little hadith? We could spend another six durus talking about this hadith. But then we were talking about the entire sharia. So it's not a matter of just reading the hadith. We want to get and dig deep into the hadith. Like I said, the goal is to get the meanings that are in here. SubhanAllah. I'm listening to a shaykh right now who's explaining the 40 hadiths of Nawawi, which we will be doing after Ramadan, inshaAllah ta'ala. And SubhanAllah, there's five CDs, MP3s full of, I don't know, maybe 80 hours a piece. Just 40 hadiths. So every hadith, there's like four or five hours. But this is dissecting the hadith like word, syllable by syllable. Alhamdulillah. So, and I don't expect to do that with you, I won't. But 
there's just so much to gain from this knowledge, from this Quran. And that's why the tafsir, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this big. And the tafsir has 10, 15 big books. If you go to tafsir ibn Kathir, for instance, depending on how big the writing is and so forth. Somebody just go perfume myself. I'm going to choke. طيب. We're on page 13, inshallah ta'ala. So, and it says here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not, if the, if the entire humanity gathers to help someone on the face of this earth, they would never be able to help them only with that which was decreed for them. And if the entire of humanity gathers to inflict harm upon someone, they will never be able to do it only if Allah has decreed that harm upon them. That the pen has been elevated and the ink is dried. What does this mean? Because there is the main book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written everything in it from the day of the creation of the pen itself because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first thing he created was al-qalam and there's a debate if it was the first or second we're not going to get into that when Allah created let's go back when Allah created the pen or the pencil or the, the pen and he told the pen to write uktub the pen said, what should I write, Ya Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Uktub ma huwa ka'inun ila yawm al -qiyamah. Write everything that is going to happen until the day of judgment. Meaning until everything is final and everyone goes to their final resort, either or their final place or their final destination, either heaven or hellfire. Everything. And I want to, in a small maybe a few minutes explain that many of us ask this question all the time. What does it mean that if the Qadr of Allah has been written, why should I go to school? Why should I study? Why should I go to work? Why should I get married? This is Qadr. I will sit at home and the right person will come because it's the Qadr of Allah. I'm going to not work because Allah is going to send me money. That's not how it works. What? When Allah wrote these things is because He knows with his ilm, what is going to happen? The final thing that's going to happen has been written. That's what it means. It's not going to be changed. He's no one. And I give you a good illustration, and I hope I don't fall out of the tafsir of the salaf. And no one points the finger at me, inshallah ta'ala. But I just want to get the, the meaning close. Like I heard one of the scholars say, he said, No one, no one, the... Um, results of the match doesn't mean that you've changed the match. Do you understand what that means? Allah knows everything that's going to happen. And Allah has decreed things upon us that will either be for us or upon us. But Allah also gave us the choice to choose. And that we showed him both paths hadaynahu and this comes from the word hidayah in arabic to hidayah is to show the path the path to clarify the path and allah said in the quran wa hadaynahu najdain that we have made clear for him the two paths amma kafiran wa imma shakura either he's going to be someone who will denounce and reject or he will be someone who is thankful, meaning that he will follow the path and he will be thankful. So we don't want to mix the two up. And there's actually a decree that is changeable. But at the end, in the, in the Umul Kitab, in the mother of the book, in the main book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote or had the Qalam write, is the final scripture is the final of everything that's going to happen and that ha that happened in the past 
in Mas'alat al-Qadar, al-Qadar is very, very, is a very fine line that we don't fall out of getting too far to an tawakul meaning that we don't do anything, and it's to the point where we push to do too much. And there's a fine line. Because sometimes you take all the asbab in the world, you do all the means, you do all the right things, and it doesn't happen for you. You get the education, you do this, you do this, but then at the end, you don't even find a job. And there's those who don't go to school, and they make way more, more, way more money than you do or ever will without any education. A good example is look at the Middle East. 50 years ago, they were running around on camels. They didn't even know what a car was. Let's say 100 years ago, before petroleum was discovered. Look what they do now. There's some people that, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, La ilaha illallah. Wallahi, there's someone from the Middle East who brought a whole, boat, a whole boat full of sand from California to put in his swimming pool. Could you imagine? The quality of sand in, in Arabia is really not that great. And out of all the rich people that I'm sure we've seen or heard about, I've never heard of anybody putting sand in their swimming pool. Because if you want sand, you go to the beach. You have a house, you buy a little island on the beach, whatever. I mean, subhanAllah. And then you get someone who is highly educated, who memorizes Quran, who's a scholar of the Muslims, who is highly accepted, inshaAllah, in the eyes of Allah, is loved by Allah. And he lives a very, very simple life. All of these things that happen in this dunya are relative. Allah sometimes gives somebody wealth either to keep them as a Muslim or to keep them as a kafir. You're thinking what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this dunya to whom he wants and whom he doesn't want but he only gives the deen to those who he wants. There's some people, if you put them in a poor status, they might be kafir, they might become kafir. Because they'll ask, oh Allah, why not me? Why am I poor? Why is he rich? And they have a huge problem accepting this. So Allah gives them a little wealth because he wants them to go to Jannah. It could be because their parents were good parents. What happened in Qisat al-Kahf? Because the father, was a good father, and, the, and the, he died, and he left his children. So when Al-Khidr came with Musa alayhi salam, and he found this wall, he put the wall up, he built this wall, and Musa alayhi salam, he asked, he said, by you building this wall, you could have got some money. Because when they came to the town, and they asked the people to help feed them, they did not want to feed them. So Musa alayhi salam, the same town, and as soon as they walked by this wall and they saw the wall fallen, they took and they built this wall up. He said, if you wanted, you could have got a reward or you could have got paid for this so we can buy some food. These people didn't even want to give us food. Why are you helping them out? Why are you building this wall? So he told them that under this wall, there's a treasure for these two orphan kids and their father used to be someone who did good deeds. So because the father did good deeds, Allah protected the children. So if you see someone, you're like, oh, why is this? Maybe their father made a dua one time at the Kaaba, or they memorized Quran, or they did something for this child, that Allah is protecting that child. These are things we don't know about. So don't ask too many things. Just ask about you. Look at yourself in the mirror and work on you. Don't worry about what's going on with him or her. Toy. So he said, So we have to understand there's a fine line between having acceptance of the decree and just sitting there and doing nothing and saying, oh, it's been decreed upon me and actually going out there and doing things. But yet when you go out and do things, don't think that 
You are the one who makes it happen. It's all about me. If it wasn't for me, it wasn't for you. I don't think Bill Gates could have done anything to get this rich if it wasn't by Qadr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Impossible. We know he's not the most intelligent. You know he didn't even finish college, right? And there's many people who have triple PhDs. So we know he's not the smart. He's not the good, best looking guy. So we know it's not his looks. He didn't inherit any money to kick him off, to boost him off, to get this rich, you know, to start. Because there's a lot of people you talk to, oh brother, you need money to do this. You don't need nothing. You need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission for you to get it. That's it. But it's by Qadr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this, he, when he imagined this, he could have never, never in a million years imagined that he would become this rich. Ever. It's by Qadr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be accepting of that. So we want to have the fine line between accepting the decree by working and doing al asbab and by understanding that whatever is for you, it's because Allah wanted it for you and whatever has been decreed upon you, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed it upon you in a nutshell. طيب. We're going to finish insha'Allah. And there's وَفِي رِوَيَةْ غَيْرَ الْتِرْمِذِي in another riwayah of this hadith, another narration, it says, And this is just another narration of this hadith, is to explain it, where it says, in another narration states, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, safeguard, meaning safeguard the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find him before you. And this is the same thing. If you protect the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your direction. Tajidhu amama. Ta'araf ala Allahi fi shiddati ya'arifka fi rakha. If you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are patient in the time of hardship, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the time of um, easement. Because most people, when they have things good, everything's happening for them, things are good, they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is by proof. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورٌ And very few of my servants are thankful. And thankful doesn't mean like back in your country or my country or wherever you talk to somebody like, Alhamdulillah, everything's good. I don't know if you guys do that, but the Arabs, we do that. Alhamdulillah, wishu afa. I don't know what that means. Maybe Allah gave him a good hand so he can work, so he's kissing. You talk to someone and you say, how's it, how's everything? Well, alhamdulillah, brother. Yeah, the car broke down this week and my daughter just got a divorce and my son passed away. Why do you just say alhamdulillah? They say alhamdulillah, khalas, don't state. Sometimes it's okay to state to help relieve some of the misery to someone. But if you just met somebody and you want to tell them your problems, and you met the other guy, you come to the masjid to meet 10 people to tell them your problems. Where's the ajab? You need to wait, you need to be patient. And yes, if you have somebody that you, you love or somebody you um, cherish or someone that you respect and you tell them what's going on so they what you're expecting for them is to say Akhi, be patient Akhi, isbar. it's okay Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you may Allah forgive you may, this is what you want from them it's okay but don't say it because there's something boiling in your heart and it's, it's you have a problem and you just want to go and tell everybody so you're not happy with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ali radiallahu anhu said that the qadr is going to fall upon you whether you like it or not that Ali radiallahu anhu, he said that the decree is going to fall upon you. Whether you like it or not, you can't change it. If death comes, you can't change it. If sickness, illness, uh, losing a job, losing money, you can't do nothing to change it. But, 
The thing that you can change and you can control is your attitude and how you accept and how you deal with these events. So if you deal with this event and you are accepting it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you tranquility and will replace it with something better. But if you sit there and you're, you're nagging and you're not happy and you're just having a pity party, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will just leave you. So if you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the good times, in the glad tidings, when things are going well, and how, what's the best way to make shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who can help us? Who wants to raise their hand? The best, the best way for someone to give shukr, to give thanks, to be thankful is what? Tayyib. What else? Salah. Naam? Salah. Salat? Make sujood. More practical. You get in something that is tangible, and when you give thanks, you give something that is tangible back to you. Ah, oh, mashallah. If Allah gives you money, if you want to be thankful towards this money, first of all, you pay zakat. Second of all, you help others with this money that Allah has given you as, as a test. He didn't give it to you because you are deserving of it. If that was the case, the Prophet ﷺ would be the richest of men. So this is how you give thanks. By taking this ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you and you spread it with others and you help others and you use it for the sake of Allah. And even with that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you even more. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَا نَقَصَ مَالٌ مِّن صَدَقَةٌ that the money is never decreased when you give sadaqah. So you don't lose. But you have to have the faith and the iman to when you have a thousand in your pocket and you give away 500 that you know you're going to get back that 500 plus the ajr, plus more than the 500. This is what we want. This is what we want in this ummah. If we can change anything, this is what we need to change. Not every time we have an event we have to beg for money. It's like we're going out there and buying these cars and villas and homes. Subhanallah, look at the Christian preachers. They're all living the life of lavish. But when a Muslim sheikh or an imam or someone who is an imam of a masjid and we give out sadaqah, we're always paying attention. Is he wearing a brand new pair of shoes? Did he wear a new qamis? Oh, he bought a new car and they just got about 200,000 last night. He must have bought it. Why? Subhanallah. This is dhulm. Did you give this money for the sake of Allah or did you give it to sit there and watch where it's going to go? Yes, we want to be accountable. We want to make sure that the masjid is accountable and the people working there are accountable. They're not wasting the money of the Muslims. Not your money. This is the biggest issue. There's a difference in the niyyah. We have some people, they walk in. And I have to talk about this. I am sorry, I have to. And we get some people that they go pay, they pay a hundred dollars a month, or in Ramadan they give a thousand or whatever it is, and then they sit every day. If it wasn't for us, the masjid wouldn't be built. If it wasn't for us, they wouldn't have got carpet. This is our masjid. Subhanallah. Did you give for the sake of Allah? Why do you even want people to know that you give sadaqah? The best sadaqah is the sadaqah that is hidden. حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمَ شِمَالَهُ مَا أَنْفَقَتْ يَمِينُهُ شِمَالُهُ مَا أَنْفَقَتْ يَمِينُهُ That the left hand doesn't know what the right hand has given. And this is a kinaya in Arabic. And this is to show the highest of secrecy. They used to go at night and they used to wear and they used to cover their faces and not show. And when they, get, they knock on the door and they give sadaqah, they put their hand out and they run the other way. So the guy who's receiving the sadaqah doesn't know who they are. Or they would put in, knock on the door, put him from the house and walk away. Yes, there are some times that the sadaqah in public is better if it's going to motivate people. And the Prophet ﷺ did this as well. The Prophet ﷺ did this when he was asking to prepare for the army. 
And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he came and he put a big bag of money in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Could you imagine the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting and asking you and you and you for money? Would you give all your money? Would you give half of it? Would you give some of it? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he brought his money and he put it in front of the Prophet sallallahu Umar radiallahu anhu was so excited. And he came to the Prophet sallallahu and he was happy. And he brought this money and he put it in front of the Prophet sallallahu And what was he saying? He said, today, al-yawma aghlibu Abu Bakr. Today I will beat Abu Bakr. And the Prophet sallallahu knows. that these two are always competing. And he said in front of everybody, he said, Ya Umar, ma tarakta li ahlik. Oh Umar, what did you leave for your family, meaning for you, for your family, to spend on them? And Umar radiallahu anhu with all his might and big, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu used to be a big man. When he sat on the donkey, his feet would reach the ground. Big guy. And that's why when he became Muslim, he looked at Quraysh and he said, for those of you whom their mother wants to bury them tonight, they follow me, I'm going to the Hijrah. He's the only one who left and not in secret. And he said, if any one of you of Quraysh wants their mother to bury them tonight, they can follow me beyond this mountain. I'm going to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Akbar. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he stood, uh, he stood up and he said, Taraktu lahum nusfa mali. I left for them half of my wealth. Meaning that I brought all of my wealth. I brought half of my wealth. I left half for my family. Not 5%, not 10%, not $20. I left half of my wealth for my family. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Abu Bakr, ماذا تركت لأهلك? قال تركت لهم الله ورسوله. That Abu Bakr said, I left nothing but their mess the messenger of Allah. I left Allah and, the and his messenger, meaning I left nothing for my family. I gave everything to you, Ya Rasulullah. And Abu Bakr said, after today, I will never race with. Umar said, I will never race or compete with Abu Bakr after today. So having that said, I just have a cold, my eyes are sweating. It's hot in here. <laughs> when you are asked, inshallah ta'ala, and Ramadan is going to come, to give sadaqah, don't think. If you have someone ill in your family, give sadaqah. If you are doing something that you shouldn't be doing, and you know it's wrong, give sadaqah. If you have money and you're thinking, did I pay my zakat right? Give sadaqah. If you did something ill with someone, give sadaqah. If you want more money, give sadaqah. Wallahi, every time I get in a pinch, I'm thinking, let me give some sadaqah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help me out. Do it on faith. Do it with iman and watch. Watch the miracles. Sisters, you want to get married? Give sadaqah. Brothers, you want to get married? Give sadaqah. And give sadaqah with that intention and see miracles happen in your life. It might not happen the first time, but after doing it, because Allah is testing you, not because Allah doesn't know what you're going to do. La hasha wa kalla. Allah tests us so we can see what we would have done or what we are going to do. So on the day of judgment, that which we do is either for us or against us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who's going to hellfire and knows who's going to Jannah. So if He just created us and put these people in Jannah and these people in hellfire, subhanahu wa ta'ala would not be transgressing against anyone. Because He is all, the all-knowing. But it's in for us. So on the day of judgment, 
if we don't accept the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the kuffar will do, they will say, oh Allah, we didn't do this. Oh Allah, we didn't say this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, are you sure? Let them have a witness from amongst them. And this is when their mouths are shut and their hands start to speak and their feet start to speak and their tongue and mouth actually start to speak that what will be held against them. Meaning for someone to sit there and argue with Allah, they will be punished. If you sit and you argue with Allah like you do in this dunya, and this is the point I wanted to get to, you talk to a brother and say, brother or sister, why did you do this and this is haram? They have a million justifications. Well, brother, this is because this, and this is because this, and this is because this. And they always try to justify what they're doing is wrong, is right. And this is one of the slifat, this is one of the characteristics of the hypocrites. If he gets into an argument, he tries to override you with talking and speech. That he gets out of the way in the path of the truth. So it's very important when you hear the truth, what do you say? Who knows? They said, we heard and we obey. Allah, forgive us and to you we shall return. Even when they said we heard, meaning we obey, we heard, we obey. We heard, put them in stage. We heard, we obey, ask for forgiveness. We heard, we obey, forgive us. Why would someone ask for forgiveness when they said we heard? So they acknowledged, then they obeyed. And even with that, they asked for forgiveness. Who can tell us why? Naam? Because they wanted the ajr. Just it's at least a decent answer. Naam. Yes, what? Because it's probable that they will do it not in the in the way that befits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not do this deed complete. The best example for that in our lives is when after we say the salat, after we do the salat, what do we say? Astaghfirullah three times. Even though after the salat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives, if not all of the minor sins. So when we ask forgiveness, it's because of our shortcomings. But look at subhanallah, this is the characteristic of the believer, the characteristic of the Muslim. What did Banu Israel say? What did the Jews say? We can still use this terminology here, right? It's not, uh, not, it's not forbidden in America yet, because <laughs> in France it's forbidden. Yes, they are people of the book. <laughs> what did they say? وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَعَصَيْنَا وَأُشْرِبُ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْعَجْرِ they said we heard and we disobeyed. And the love of the calf was absorbed in their heart. Look at the difference between Ummah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On the battle of Badr, what did they say? And I know I'm a little bit off subject, but it's very important. Wallah, it's extremely important. Because we're building aqidah in these young kids. That's what we want. We don't just sit and read the book. You read it at home, inshallah. We're just using it as a guide. The people, uh, the followers, the Sahaba of Muhammad وسلم, what did they say on the day of Badr? One of the Sahaba, he said, Ya Rasulullah, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتل فقاتل إنا معكما مقاتلون ولا نقول كما قالت بني إسرائيل 
اذهب انت وربك فقاتل انها هنا قاعد الله look at the difference this guy is at the extreme point of west and this guy is at the extreme or this group is at the extreme side of the east and they said the sahaba said on the day of badr we will not say like the jews said to musa alayhi salam go you and your lord they didn't even say our lord they didn't say go in the lord they said اذهب انت وربك your lord that means it's not their lord والعياذ بالله their lord is their hawa their lord is the money the international bank huh? this is their lord اذهب انت وربك فقاتل go you and your lord and fight we're just going to sit here and wait for you guys this is exactly what they said and Ummah Muhammad وسلم, said, Go, Ya Rasulullah, you and your Lord fight, and we are with you fighting. Huge difference. A huge difference. So the Muslim, by his nature, he is not argumentative. They teach you in this country and in the West in general to be argumentative. Ask all the questions. It's okay to ask questions. But then we need you to act too. Don't just sit there and ask and ask. Don't have paralysis of analysis. And that's what most people have. They're, oh, I'm not going to do it until I get all my questions answered. I don't care what happens. Am I here to grab you and take you to Jannah by force? Like some people say that Islam was spread by the sword. That's why we have thousands of Muslim women of women becoming Muslim in this country the most liberated women on the face of the earth ever in the history of humanity they're getting an Islam because we came here and forced them by the sword come on let's be realistic so when you hear this you have a response 67 percent of the converts of, of the West are women 67 percent I don't know why we got off on this subject. Maybe someone came here and they needed to hear that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put that on my tongue. So we have to not be argumentative. Yes, it's okay to question. So if you learned a lot of science and a lot of math and a lot of biology and you have an issue with one plus one has to equal two, why do you believe in Jannah and Nar then? Do you believe in some of the book and deny the other part of it? It's either you believe in all of it or you deny all of it. Don't sit, don't be washy-washy. Because -washy. Muslims who are wishy-washy, they lose. They're not enjoying this dunya and they're not enjoying the akhirah. They are stuck in between. Because a sister who doesn't wear proper hijab, she's stuck in between two fires. She's not fitting in with those who don't wear hijab. And she knows when she goes to the masjid and she's wearing a wishy-washy hijab that people are talk, looking at her in a weird way. Yes, we say, may Allah forgive her, may Allah give her hidayah, may Allah give her extra iman. But it's not like when I see a sister, munaqaba, fully in black, I can't tell anything of her bodily functions. And I say, may Allah give her thabat. May Allah increase her ranks in Jannah. May Allah protect her. I don't even know the sister, I could know, I, I see her, wallahi, I see many sisters as I'm driving down Minneapolis and I see, and to be honest, they're Somali sisters, not the Arabs, the Arabs are having fun. They are just eating and drinking and at the buffet. Illa man rahima rabbi. That's why you don't see any of them here. It's very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Dharhum ya'kulu wa yatamatta'u. Let them eat and drink and enjoy life. They will see what's going to happen to them and it's what, what was waiting for them. What was the beginning of the ayah? Alif Lam Ra. Tilka ayatul kitabi wa Quran in Mubin. Aruba maya waddu ladina kafaru law kanu muslimin. Zarhum ya kuluayta matta'ud. Allah is talking about the kuffar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, maybe the kuffar, the non-believers, they wish that they were Muslims. Wa sadaqallah. 
how are these people coming into Islam? Is it because the Muslims are out there doing this extreme great da'wah? Wallahi, we are committing chaos in the dunya. We are walking around, we are scaring the people away from Islam. And by the mercy of Allah, they're going into Islam by the thousands. Not by our deeds, not because we are so organized. Not because when we go to the masjid and people walk by that masjid think, what is going on in there? Is there anyone that actually got their license? Or are these all like 15 year old kids that still learn how to drive? Go to Jumu'ah, every masjid, I don't care, no exception. You will say chaos. Handicapped spot, taking two spots, parking crooked. Even worse yet, some people get out of the car and say, brother, can you park this car for me? I don't know how to park it. People blocking everybody behind. And then after waiting for 20 minutes, you ask, you say, brother, uh, do you do this when you go to Cup Foods? Or the Rainbow? Or when you come into the premises of the masjid, you remember back home, so you become chaotic. It's like you just kind of, you know, you forget back home and you're like, yeah, let me remind myself. Is this what we do? Look at the Muslims, what are the Muslims doing? Why are most of the, the poor countries in the world are Muslim countries? And if the, Muslim, the rich Muslims in the Gulf alone give their zakat, there will not be any poor people on the face of the earth. I'm not talking about Muslims, on the face of the earth. Now, add to that the Muslims of the world and America and China, millions all over. If these people were just given the zakat, or just a, a $10 a month sadaqah. Something where we can be organized that every single person can afford, the rich or the poor. Everybody would be well off. But no, he's Somali, he's Oromo. I can't marry you. How else do not you guys just sit there and not get married and just watch Jessica walking around naked all day? You guys need to do this. We need to do this. We need to get close as a home, especially in America. If you want to have this tribalism, go back home and have it. It's there. Enjoy it. Here we need to be together. We need to be strong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the kuffar, what did he say? Maybe the non-believers, the kuffar, they wish that they were Muslim. And you hear this. You hear this from some brothers or sisters. They said, well, I wish I was Muslim. I wish I could be Muslim. But there's pressures out there that don't let them be. Like at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if someone became Muslim, he was expelled of that community. So they wish they were Muslim. Allah knows what's in their heart. But they don't do it. Either because of pride or because of fear. And the same thing here. And we can take this ayah qiyasan by um, making things equivalent. We can look at those who don't practice Islam properly. They're thinking, and please I'm not trying to punch the brothers because I talked about the hijab. Now we have to talk about the hijab of the brothers, which is the beard. A lot of the brothers don't wear the beard. Why? Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. I'm afraid they're going to look at me and say, this brother is this. This brother is that. He is in a certain category. But to be honest with you, I want to conclude with this, about this whole idea of beard and hijab. I don't think any single male, those are here, those are watching, and Muslim, deep inside, if they are Muslim and they love Islam and they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, no, no, none of us would want their, their daughters, sisters and mothers not to be properly covered. Just out of the slightest of jealousy and out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone says, I want my wife not to be covered, they have to put like a big question mark on their forehead that says, am I Muslim? But for any of us who do this, we were so pleased when our wives wear the proper hijab, we are more pleased you hear a lot of brothers brag when their daughters and their wives wearing proper hijab. Oh, mashallah, my wife just wore niqab. Even though he might be scared to death. <laughs> and I tell you something so we're not so serious, you know. My wife, alhamdulillah, she wears niqab. And I said, if you ever get in a tra traffic jam, 
jump on top of your van, say Allahu Akbar, and everybody will disperse and then you can get where you want to go fast and shall. Alhamdulillah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> on a more serious note, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the man to be the sustainer of the family, to be the lion, to be the king. And if you are the king, and you expect your wife to be the queen, you have to be the king. So if your wife or daughter comes home, and they have like five or six stories, like this man looked at me weird, this sister said this to me, I could see people, this person gave me the finger, whatever it is, we all have similar stories that happen for every now and then. If we pay attention, you'll see that you feel a little bit of hardship walking down the street when you're wearing a hijab especially after a, a huge campaign about Muslims in the media some week or another. And the sisters feel this. And the sisters are the ones who have weak Iman. More than the men. What do I mean by this? I don't mean that sisters don't have Iman. No, that they are more sensitive than the men are. Because if somebody gives me the finger, I'm not going to sit and cry. A sister might cry. I might go out there and punch him out. <laughs> All you Muslims are violent. <laughs> Extremely violent. Shouldn't have gave me the finger. He's violent too. فَوَكَزَهُ مُوسَى فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Punched him and he killed him. No, on a serious note. So your daughter, your wife, your mother, they come home and they have two, three heroic stories. And you're like, yeah, good job. You took one for a snap. But you, who's supposed to be the warrior, the defender, the contender, the man, the alpha male, don't have any stories when you come home. You come home with a pack of Gillette in your, from Walmart. Look, honey, I was in the aisle fighting to get my Gillette so tomorrow I can be nice, clean shaven. No, please, I'm not attacking anyone, please. Wallahi, I don't mean this to anyone. And I know every Muslim wants to have a beard, wants to put on a beard. I'm just trying to give you a few punches, so maybe you put one on. You, maybe you just need a nudge. And if you get fired from your job for the sake of Allah, مَنْ تَرَكَ شَيْئًا لِلَّهِ عَوَّضَهُ اللَّهُ خَيْرٌ, خيرا مِنْ If you leave something for the sake of Allah, guaranteed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it with that which is greater and better. Because what are we talking about now? We turn around and we came back about decree, about qadr, about believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I don't want anybody here to say, oh brother, this is a sunnah. Is this a sunnah mu'akkada? Is this ha Please. Regardless of what the arguments are, I just want you to be the lion of the house and have a couple of stories. Let's put it that way. Play? All right. So we talked about um, barakallahu fiqh. We want the sisters to be proud of you, you know? <laughs> Wallahi, when you guys put on the beard and you take one for Islam, you cannot imagine how much your daughters and wives will be proud of you. Because the woman, by her nature, she wants somebody who has this nature in them. They're willing to go out there and take one. A couple punches here and there. That's why when you watch in all the movies, the warriors, they come, they have cuts here, they have a blind eye, and they get the most beautiful women. You guys watch movies, right? Yes. Of course. <laughs> MashaAllah. It's usually the rough guys, the heroes, the ones that are jumping off of buildings, blowing up things. They always get the girl at the end. Even the kuffar, they portray that if you're a warrior, that's what the women like. And it's very true. Even Muslim women. Because they are women. By nature. Now don't go say I'm going to go blow something up or the sheikh said let's go do something crazy. Please. That's not what I'm talking about in a million years. Well, I'm so far away from that that I don't even know where that is. It's downtown. Hold on. They're going to put out a search in downtown tonight. But seriously. When you're out there working, 
If, you're, if your wife is working, brothers, and you're not working, she loses respect for you. Guaranteed. If you ask her and she's honest enough, she might tell you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the men. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the men are the sustainers of the women. Period. By law, meaning sharia law, by law Islamically, and by the laws of nature, the creation, the way Allah created the human beings. Look at most rich people. The men's out there working and the women, they go shopping all day. They don't work. The woman doesn't want to work in her nature. She wants to look pretty and sit in front of the mirror for five hours and look pretty for you, the warrior. Yeah. So if you want to have a balance in your life, for the youth that are listening to me and those who are married, if you want to have a great balance in your life, stand up and be the warrior in your family. And you will see changes like you won't believe. Because now, a lot of men, they come and they complain and they say, my wife doesn't listen to me. You know why? Because you're not worthy of being listened to. I'm serious. Ask the women. Wallahi, sisters, if, you, if I, what I'm talking about is wrong, send up some letters right now. We got 15 minutes before. Uqsimu billah. I want to test it right now. Please write something and either yes or no. If whatever I said is wrong, write and tell me what I said wrong so we can hear, so we can give you the proof, inshallah ta'ala. Please. Write this down, especially those who are married or those who are looking to get married or those who are of age that understand what it is to, to, uh, uh, to have a man in their life or whatever the case may be or looking for a man. Please write it down and I will show you by proof. So we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you know him in the good times when everything is good and dandy and may you send that be waqt al-rakha, when times are easy, when money is abundant, and you know these things, that you will understand that you have to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only by saying alhamdulillah and giving thanks verbally, yes, you have to do that, but by actually, because what is, your actions speak louder than words. So by your actions, you will show that you love Allah and that you are thankful. If somebody asks for your help, don't say it. Five dollars. Give him the five dollars. Allah subhanahu wa taala will give, give you ten, or fifty maybe, ten times more, right? So that what Allah subhanahu wa taala wa'alam and nasra ma sabr and know the Prophet sallallahu said and know that victory comes with patience. Victory comes with patience. Victory in this life. Victory over the problems. Over this hardship. Patience in general is what's going to lead to victory, whether it's in a certain matter, whether it's in a war, whether it's in a situation, any kind of hardship you can imagine, it will only be eased with patience and you will become victorious. The more patient you are, and we ask Allah sabr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us patience and to, get, to keep us of those who are patient. Allahumma amin. Wa anna al-faraja وَإِنَّ الْفَرَجَ لَا نَقُولُ وَإِنَّ الْفَرَجَ وَإِنَّ الْفَرَجَ For those of you who are studying Arabic or the Arabics, because the word الْفَرْجُ is different than الْفَرَجُ Okay? So if you understand Arabic, you know what I said. If not, don't worry about it. وَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ And that with hardship comes easement. Guaranteed. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ the second hadith we want to talk about and that we want to conclude with tonight, um, or start on, I should say, is عن معاذ بن جبل قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا معاذ أتدري ما حق الله على العباد قال الله ورسوله أعلم قال أن يعبدوه ولا يشرك به شيئا قال أتدري ما حقهم عليه قال الله ورسوله أعلم وقال أن لا يعذبهم that the Prophet ﷺ was talking to Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu. And he said, O oh, Mu'adh, and this is the second hadith, the right of Allah upon his slaves or upon his creation. He said, Ya Mu'adh, do you know what is the right 
of Allah upon His servants, upon His slaves. Sometimes the word slave, if you put it in a connotation, might not look great. But it means the servants as well. To be a slave to Allah is to be the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And write this down, inshaAllah ta'ala, for those of you who are writing things down. If you are a slave to other than Allah, understand that those that you are a slave to will take that which is good from you. This is not in the book. If you are a slave to other than Allah, for instance, you are a slave to your boss. You are a slave to your wife, you're a slave to your child, you're a slave to someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you will, that this person will take the good from you. That if you are a slave to someone, what does it mean you're a slave to someone? So we can understand inshallah ta'ala. Doesn't mean that you make sujood and ruku'ah to them. No, but you are so afraid of them. Like when you work with someone and they say you can't do Jumu'ah for the men. And you sit there, okay, why? Why don't you quit this job? Because you are a slave to this money. You are a slave to the system. You are a slave to that boss. Many things. How would you be a slave to that boss? Well, let's say this boss brought you from a different country and they have you working with them. If they fire you, that means he's going to report you to immigration. You have to go back home. So now you're a slave to them. For instance, as an example, they say, don't pray right now. We have to work. You say, okay. I'll pray later when I go home. I knock them all out together. The five prayers, you know, tuck, 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 tuck. Or you become what is called a Friday, a Friday worshiper. A Friday worshiper. Just like the Christians are Sunday worshipers. Or you're a Eid worshiper. Over 100,000 people in this community, we only see them on Eid. Sometimes you're thinking, did you just immigrate last night from Texas or Somalia or Tunisia or back home, wherever it is that you come from? Well, not the Somalis, Wallahi. Zalamtuhum. The Somalis, we see them everywhere, alhamdulillah. I will be honest, but them Arabs, the Arab countries, may Allah give the Arabs tawfiyah. May Allah give them iman. And all of the Muslims, they carry the language of the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put the mercy in their heart so they come back to Allah and they fear Him, inshaAllah ta'ala. And if being Arab means to be proud that, you, that the Prophet ﷺ is Arab, don't forget also that Abu Jahl was Arab. Yes, you can be proud to be Arab, but that doesn't give you a green card to go to Jannah. Because if anyone was going to get a green card to go to Jannah because they are Arab and they are close to the Prophet ﷺ, would be who? Who could tell us? Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu He would be the least of all of the, those in hellfire that will be punished. And what is this punishment going to be? That he will be sitting in a pair of shoes that are boiling. It's so hot that his brain boils from the heat of those shoes. Or he will be stepping on coals that those, he will be standing on coals that they are so hot that his brain will fry and bubbled from and boiled from him. This is the least of the people in hellfire because he helped the Prophet Sallallahu through his journey. But even that did not give him a green pass to Jannah. Because he did not say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So we have to be very careful with that. So When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, what I was trying to finish and I wanted you to write down inshallah ta'ala is, if you are a slave to someone, like we mentioned at work, or something, you love something so much that it becomes a problem, that it deters you from the worship. Like 
basketball match, football, soccer match, the World Cup's coming up this year, or what year is it? Huh? Don't pretend like you guys don't know. When is it? Next year? I heard it's in Brazil. Is that right? I got that one right. Right? MashaAllah. May Allah forgive your parents. <laughs> Because if you're five and you know when the World Cup is, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> Play. So being a slave to someone, they will get the good from you. When you're a slave to someone and you don't fear them, and you don't go pray, for instance, those five, ten minutes to go pray, did they not get the good from you? Sahih? Even the fact that they know that they own you, they have you by a chain, is not a good feeling. But if you give and you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nilta khair Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you will receive the good from Allah, the only one that you worship properly and you give your time to in your devotion, that you get good from is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he doesn't need our worship, he doesn't need our money, he doesn't need nothing. It's by the mercy, or by his mercy, that he gives us things. The two difference, extremes. If you give to other than Allah, they take the goodness from you. If you give to Allah, you get the goodness of Allah. <coughs> Subhanallah. <coughs> so when you are a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a something, is something you can be proud of. And the human beings, by their nature, the way Allah, the Creator, created them, is they need to have something or someone to worship. And that's why people worship cows. It's beyond me that someone who has a triple PhD in nuclear science and they bow to the cow. I don't get it. And there's millions of them in India who are highly educated and Allah forbid that the cow tries to cross the street on a busy morning. Why were you late? Kamar Sharmak and Mesh, whatever his name is, not to make fun of the, our brothers from India and no, we're talking about those who are non-believers. Oh, the cow was crossing the street. Okay, good for you. We come to work now with the blessings of the cow. Oh, can you believe this? This cow is so righteous that people in other countries eat it. How can a Lord how can an ilah be eaten? I mean, where is the common sense? How about those who worship the hair and those who worship the private parts of male and female and those who worship nails and those who worship rats and snakes? They actually worship, they have a temple full of rats and other people killing them. It's unbelievable. This is a proof, this is a dalil that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives hidayah to whom he pleases. You, the greatest ni'mah that every single Muslim should be thankful for, non-stop, is ni'matul Islam, is that you have ni'matul hidayah, that you actually worship the true creator of the heavens and the earth. <coughs> this is the best, the, the, the biggest thing that a Muslim should be thankful for. After that, it doesn't matter if they cut you to pieces. Because you know this is just a test. We're only here for a little short time, and after that, we're, inshallah, we go to Jannah. That's it. So when you are a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you get the good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the ultimate good that we will receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who can tell us? Now, Jannah. Play, you're close. Jannah. What else? Jannah. Jannah? Okay, what else? 
you're close. Jannah is close. There's something else. Now, peace of mind. I said the ultimate reward that we will receive. Now, another, another ila ila Allah subhanahu wa taala to look to see Allah subhanahu wa taala on the day of judgment. What else? There's something higher. Nope. Arriba. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us. On the day of judgment, the believers will, the only thing that they love and they want to see and they hear is when Allah subhanahu after they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their own eyes, we ask Allah that He make us of those who will see, will see Him and be pleased with seeing Him inshaAllah ta'ala. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O people of paradise, O people of Jannah, I am pleased with you, you will never have hardship. Do you want anything else? Ask me, every single one of you, ask me what do you want? What else do you want? They've been in Jannah, they've had the hoor, they enjoyed eating food and they did everything they want. And they've been doing it and they're gonna do it inshallah ta'ala. And Allah on top of this asks them, what else can I do for you? What do they say? They say, oh Allah, did you not whiten our faces on the day that people had black faces? Did you not enter us Jannah? Did you not give us this? Did you not do this? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you not want that I give you more than all of that? And they say, what ya Allah? أَنْ يَحِلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ رِضَايَ فَلَا أَسْخَطُ عَلَيْكُمْ أَبَدًا that I bestow my peace and acceptance and my ple I'm pleased with you, my pleasure with you that I will never or you will never see any hardship ever. This is the highest reward that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we, we get by worshiping Him on this dunya that this is only a sabab, this is only a means for us to end up in Jannah, to end up in paradise, inshallah ta'ala. Next week, I promise we will move for, more forward in the book, but these are just a few things we really have to talk about and establish, so we have a basis on what to move uh, forward with, inshallah ta'ala. Next week, we will get more deeper into uh, what it means to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what does it mean um, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, will not uh, punish those who worship him properly inshallah ta'ala on page 14 um, let's look at these really fast no, mashallah. Like, these we will talk about next week because I need to elaborate does anybody have a question inshallah ta'ala so be, if you wrote this be here next week because you misunderstood what I meant in general inshallah but yes go ahead who has a question, inshallah? Anything about what we've talked about? Alhamdulillah. Naam. Uh, we ain't got time to start over. I was late. Naam. We ain't got time to start over. I was late. Next halaqa will be here next week, inshallah. Don't be late, but we're not going to start over. <laughs> we're already late as it is. So, um, but we usually will talk about a lot of this as we go on, inshallah ta'ala in the halaqas inshallah ta'ala jazakallah khair but there is actually a recording so talk to the brothers yeah, there'll be a good a, a good recording that uh, you could go back to i think it's visual and um this book yeah, if anybody know. wants this book it's a hundred hadith about islamic manners i only brought about 30 copies from egypt with me once again but you can find this book online at darus salam here in the states i think it's six seven bucks plus the shipping might come out to ten dollars so you actually, whoever bought it, got it for like half the cost. Um, if you need it and if you want to get it, it's a very good book. It's precise, it's concise. Um, and we're going to do our best to try to finish a lot of it, if not most of it, before Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. For any of you who want to get it, it's online. Tayyip, I think the Adhan is in about maybe five minutes, inshallah ta'ala. We'll let everybody get ready for those who need to make wudu and get prepared. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته